Uh, so, this is a talk primarily about my attitude, uh, my opinion, my perspective on liberty and libertarianism and what we're trying to achieve um, and if that's, you know, how that changes over time. And I don't want to offend anybody and I don't want to demean anybody. I think we're all pushing in the same direction. Um, so, this is going to be in some sense personal, but in some sense it's also going to hopefully play out into what you all experience and maybe where you guys are all at as well. Uh, so, what's been interesting to me uh, is that living here in New Hampshire, I tend to associate with a lot of really radical libertarians. People that do a lot of Bitcoin outreach, uh, people that cop block, uh, people that run for all types of office and pushing for marijuana decriminalization and you know an end to the knife ban and so forth and constitutional carry, there's just all types of things happening. And, People are coming from different directions to try to create the world that we want. You know, and that's that's what Porkfest is about as a marketing tool to attract people to that. Um, and then sometimes I leave and I go to other libertarian events. I go to Students for Liberty or I go to you know other types of maybe more academic venues like Mises or something. And I find that uh, the demeanor and the perspective and the strategies and the goals are all a little bit different depending on who you talk to. Um, I guess the ultimate goal is always kind of abstract, calling kind of those, well, we want maximum freedom in my lifetime. It's like, okay, well, how do we do that? It's like saying, I want, it's like saying, I want, I want $10 million in my lifetime. It just totally leaves open the question of what you're going to do to get it or what is the best way to get it or something like that. Uh, so there's this kind of common goal that we share that we're all pushing towards. And I think that there's, at least in my development, there's been different um, stages of the evolution of my thinking about these goals. And so what I'm going to discuss is kind of my opinion and my experience, and uh, I guess don't take it too literally, but when I started on this process of thinking about these issues, um, I think uh, unless you were born to an anarchist family uh, or you encountered it very early or something like that, I was, you know, your basic, um, basic cable programming status, just with the typical ideas of what government should do and what it shouldn't do and hadn't really analyzed the ideas much and you know it, it makes sense that you should you know, impose tariffs because the country has to regulate what comes in the country and I had all these kind of associated ideas that I've taken from school or I've taken from news or I've taken from my parents you know about George Bush and Republicanism or whatever whatever and I started to think about these ideas and I took a, a course in economics in high school and I read a little bit of Henry Hazlitt and other people and I became um, in, in the direction of constitutionalism. You know, I said, you know what, we, this would be really a lot better if we went back to this document that seems to stipulate what kinds of rules and limits the government has to follow, and if, if somehow we can get this respected again, then we can undo a lot of the damage that's happened in 200 years, right? Um, and at that point I became, you know, I was a Ron Paul supporter, and I was, you know, calling myself, you know, a libertarian, and I, there's a certain point where my ideas matriculated to a point where I knew what I wanted was the minimum conceivable government possible. You know, I had thought about other things that the governments provide, like roads or education or you know, medical care, and I had thought that you know, even the classical liberals, even Jefferson you know, and uh, the European liberals, you know, Voltaire and so forth, John Locke, you know, they, they went too far. They gave too much license for government. They should, you know, the government shouldn't even shouldn't even build the roads. They shouldn't even finance or create the schools or anything like that. They should just be kind of a night watchman state was the idea in my head that all they do is kind of patrol and knock on people's doors and make sure the doors are locked and you know, clean up and make sure that there's no crime or invasions that are going on. And the way to do that was we had to harken back to these ideas, principles in this document, you know, and to support that image. And I discovered that I guess while it's possible to play out that way, I think it's unlikely that we'll ever return to anything like that. And I think it's unlikely for sociological reasons, I think it's unlikely for political reasons, 
And I think that if we look at it closely enough, we see that even the Constitution does have its defects. It is not a, you know, handed from God on Mount Sinai, these carved tablets of what, how we should be organized, right? You know, it permitted slavery, and it permitted a central government to levy taxes against people that may not have ratified its existence. But it's a lot of kind of questionable things about the Constitution. Yeah. And yeah. I get a lot of that from Lysander Spooner, so it's a credit to him for that. Uh, but that's what I would look at as something like a level 10. So if I started at zero, everything from zero to 10 was a progression to a kind of minarchy, as I describe it, a kind of a night watchman state. And from the next stage of my life, and there's no, obviously, there's no discrete moments, it's all kind of continuous, but uh, the next stage that I can describe was, was wrestling with the idea of minarchy with some of the libertarian principles that I firmly believed in. Right, that value is subjective, and that I don't have the right to invade another person's property or their body. Right, those seem, you know, one's kind of an economic principle and one's kind of a moral principle or an ethical principle. And I think most of us would probably believe in things like that or close to that. And I just started to realize that in any instantiation, the government is going to invade somebody's rights or somebody's property, and there is no way to structure it. There's no way to build the architecture in a certain way that that doesn't happen. Because the state at its basis is a monopoly organization that provides law and security and defense and things like that. But the way they maintain the monopoly is by forcibly outlawing competitors from trying to offer their own dispute system or trying to offer their own law or defense system or something like that. And so that, that, um, that prohibition, that outlaw reason, is an initiation of force, you know, because if you tried to, they would take you and put you in a car and lock you up in a cage and you'd be a criminal, right? So there is always that kind of element of force to any government, however small or limited. And when I saw that gun in the room, uh, I fought, you know, I fought tooth and nail. You know, I didn't want to go into that direction. Who wants to be an anarchist, for God's sake? And so I was, uh, you know, I was a commenter on a, on a Liberty blog when I was in college. And I was a minarchist of the two other anarchists that were writing. And I got into this hundred comment long, epic, titanic debate. And I was invoking von Mises and public goods arguments. And I was invoking various types of, you know, uh, I don't know, Hayekian theories on self-organization, trying to justify the state as some kind of endogenous creation of people's, you know, implicit contractual arrangements. That I, I went to every direction that you could go to to try to justify the need for this, and it was like trying to nail jelly to a wall. And eventually, my, you know, it took about a week, but my, my interlocutor um, finally kind of punched through my skull, and it you know, took a while, not, not sleeping very well, and eventually I just, you know, woke up or realized, you know, a week later that, all right, shit, well, I guess it's it, I guess it's anarchy, then, okay, we can, let's go forward with this. And so that what I would regard as the kind of milestone of, like, a moving to 20. Um, and this is just arbitrary, this is just a kind of a silly, you know, nomenclature or whatever that I use, but that was the next huge milestone for my development in terms of thinking about liberty. You, when you're talking about anarchy, you're not talking about rights in the street, you're talking about without rulers, right? Right, anarchy without rulers, not without rules. Uh, so in a sense of having the law, the security, the defense, the restitution, all of that, provided in a competitive basis on a market system, is what I'm talking about. It's, That's not anarchy, that is uh, the libertarianism. Of course, it's a private property society, private property anarchy. Voluntarianism. A voluntarist anarchy, a voluntary society. Yep, there's all these different words for it. Uh, you know, if you read Hoppe, he's a, it's a private property order. If you read, you know, Rothbard, it's anarcho-capitalism, something like that. Um, but basically a pure libertarian order where there is no monopoly on these goods and services, right? But the question remains, okay, so you're an anarchist. Um, so the goals are different now. The goal isn't to engage with government or to change it or to improve it or to install better officers, maybe. The goal is to uh, get rid of it, uh, I guess. The goal is to kind of eradicate it and to not, to, you know, be struggling with what to do in the interim. I mean, uh, what was it, Thomas Sowell had an interview with, you know, he, he, he had an interview one time and the guy asked him, when you get rid of the Fed, you know, uh, what are you going to replace it with? Because Sowell was talking about the Federal Reserve. And he had a you know, funny comment where it's like, when you put out a fire, what do you replace it with? <laughs> when you cut out a cancer, what do you replace it with? You know, and so it's the same way with the government. People kind of have this, um, reaction or have this understanding that there's got to be some other stand-in 
for what that does. And, and I guess there is, but it's done in such a way that's competitively provided voluntarily through markets, with a price system, you know, and none of that exists the way it's currently handled. So that was a breakthrough for me, realizing that there was no validity in the system as an end in itself, right? That, you know, ideally we just do away with the whole thing. And then the question becomes, what do we do then? How do we get rid of it? And I was studying Austrian economics, and you know, now I'm studying Bitcoin and different things, and for a while the answer seemed to be education. You have to educate people. And you have to teach them about inflation and fractional reserve banking. You have to teach them about you know, uh, uh, <laughs> economics and minimum wage laws. And you have to teach them about labor unions. You have to teach them about food and product regulation. You have to teach them about all these things, the whole litany. You know, they have to understand everything from money to surveillance to, you know, and then they'll be able to break the chains off and we'll, you know, if we just educate enough people. And I got really disillusioned with that um, after a couple of years of attending conferences and talking to people and arguing and trying to, you know, um, trying to try to try that route. And it's a very similar route to the political route, um, in the sense that the political route also requires large numbers to work. Uh, if you want to convince people to vote for a candidate or to vote for this proposal or to, um, you know, vote on some kind of referendum, it takes a lot of people. You got to have mass action to make it work. And the same thing with education. You know, and the question with education is, like, how are you going to reach the TV watchers of middle America to accept a social outlook which is, you know, anti-war, which is anti-welfare, you know, getting rid of 99% of the government, or if you're, you know, like the Mises Institute, totally anarchistic. How are you going to convince enough people intellectually to be anarchists? And you won't. It's not, you can't. Um, it's not going to happen. And so that was kind of a strike for me, kind of a blow for me, and I um, started thinking about, well, there's politics, and then there's things like peaceful parenting, and there's like, well, that just takes generations, and it's like, I want to promote liberty now, I don't want to wait for, uh, wait for my children and grandchildren. So eventually what I discovered was the practice of agorism. And agorism is a polite term to the use and the proliferation of underground markets. And dealing and purchasing and selling in black and gray markets, um, not necessarily in terrible things like, like murder for hire, that would be a, a red market, I guess is the way the, the graph looks, but things that are either banned, things that are regulated, things that are prohibited, um, things that, are, that constitute in themselves victimless crimes. Right, so if I have to have a license to adjust the subluxations in your spine, and if I do that for you anyway and I don't have a license, that's me operating in the gray market because I didn't meet all of the legal criteria to engage in that kind of commerce. And when you start looking at agorism um, and you start studying, you know, what it looks like in empirical and so forth, you realize that this is happening all over the world and people just call it different things. So there's the unregulated market, the black market, what economists call system D. Uh, they refer to the total mass accumulation of all the kind of underground economies in the world and places like Brazil and Egypt and Sudan and Russia, you know, during Soviet Russia, the black market was the only market. Uh, so they're trying to calculate all of this and, you know, it's obviously rough because there's no statistics or there's very few statistics from a government perspective to analyze like GDP figures, but you know, the whole worldwide black market system is calculated in around 10 to 15 trillion dollars of output that's not being registered by governments, that's not being titled or credited, that's not, you know, that's just extra legal activity. That's the kiosk peddlers in Rio de Janeiro, you know, that's the currency exchangers in Buenos Aires, that's all the people performing work and trading labor and doing things that aren't, you know, paying taxes for it, or if they are, they're not licensed to do it, or in some way they're kind of breaking the rules. And I started to see that this agorism, this kind of worldwide resistance of the state licensure requirement and the tax rules, and just opting out of all of this uh, sanctioned, all of this, uh, this bullshit, the stuff that gets in the way of trading, all the stuff that you have to do to exchange with one another. You know, to sell, you know, to move your value from him to him, you have to go through all of this other different ways. And, you know, to open a business in Egypt, it's like 300 days, and, you know, 46 different bureaus have to approve, and there's all of this bribery and graft that goes along with it because the system is so slow, that there's favoritism played, and there's all these different turns and twists. And 
you know, you start to look at the growth of the black market, and it's it's outrageous. It's growing by you know double digits every couple of years. You look at any sector of the economy that's growing, and it's actually the underground economy, and that shouldn't be that shouldn't be unexpected from an economic perspective. You know, the same thing happened in the Roman Empire, and the same thing happened in the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you know, there's a flight to uh, underground economies. There's a flight to you know, different types of money systems, different types of barter systems. People break away from the official regulated white market economy when things get bad enough. And I think that it's important for us to promote agorism as a means to build the alternative institutions that we're looking for. So that's part of where this ties into Alt Expo is that what makes Alt Expo interesting in my eyes is that they promote not necessarily getting, you know, uh, this this idea out there of getting this person in this position of power or this kind of marketing or this cultural icon, but it's about building redundant and alternative ways to do what's currently done. So when the state comes crashing down or when it whimpers and dies and there's nobody else to provide law and security or defense, you know, it may resemble kind of a Hobbesian jungle. You know, it may resemble kind of a Mad Max anarchy. And so we don't want that. And the point is that, well, we should build those things now. And wait, and, and as the other one dies, this one become more prominent and more popular. So we're promoting alternative schooling systems, homeschooling, unschooling. We're promoting different types of healthcare systems. So just up here in New Hampshire, a lot of emphasis on food freedom, on medical freedom, a lot of emphasis, you know, a lot of alternative things like midwifery and chiropractic, and people are kind of going outside of the normal, normal status quo. Um, and I think that that's important to develop those institutions so that we have something to fall back to. That is a competitor that's better than what the state provides. You think it's you think that you're safe because you can call these men in blue costumes and they come in 20 minutes and they might end up shooting a four-year-old in the leg or something or they may end up doing something terrible. But that's your protection. Well, I have is you know maybe I have the inclusion and I just I press a, a, a touch an app on my phone and I get ten people to come in five minutes or I, I have some quick and instant response thing or I have you know, a peacekeeper app or I have some kind of alternative um, that is actually better and when you get people to adopt these better alternatives these better institutions then the state kind of it becomes obsolete because there's nothing that it can offer that can't be offered better by market participants or by or by programmers or by anything like that yes. and. When you start to look at agorism as a tool for that, you realize that the way it's currently understood and done is that it's limited. You know, Rothbard and other folks would reply to uh, Sam Conkins, kind of describer of, anarch of, of agorism, they would say, well, maybe that works for drug dealers, or maybe that will work for Mexican migrants, or maybe that will work for this and that, but how can you build a car? How can you have a factory building all these capital goods and all of the pieces of the production structure? All they're all going to be agorists. They're all not going to pay taxes, and they're all going to, you know. How, how, how do you? Wait, well, how, why wouldn't the state just crush you and come down on you? And you know, how do you build things that are larger production process than like one stage that you yourself made and sold under the table? You know, like like babysitting or something like that. So that was kind of a a, a fair objection. Um, and I started thinking about this more, and around the same time. Uh, I started thinking about ways to expand agorism and how can this be done feasibly on large scales? How can the opt-out be easy and feasible on a global scale? And that is when I uh, discovered things like Bitcoin and I discovered what I will call the crypto-anarchist term in the sense where you see these new crypto tools that are being developed, things like Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin is just, it's just a money. I mean, things like PGP, for message security, for you know, email encryption. There's already tools out there to anonymize your IP address. There's already whole programs and software out there that allow you to purchase from a decentralized marketplace. There's tools out there that people can use to opt out of state surveillance and taxation, or they can, they can obfuscate their involvement, or they can make it difficult. They can take steps out of the white market and into the black market, and into the agorist market, but because they're using specific cryptographic tools, they can't be identified. They can't be pinpointed or tracked or identified with a particular name or a legal identity or an address. Uh, so the point of crypto anarchy is making it easy for people to opt out of this established system. It's giving them the alternative money system that's needed. It's giving them the alternative 
you know, judiciary and a dispute resolution system that's needed, but it's not doing it in a way where it casts a huge spotlight on the illegal activity. You know, if there was just a, um, a center of town that was just a bastion of illegal activity and oh, all, all, all types of terrible things people would be free to do, you know, the police would quickly see, they'd quickly come and arrest people and make a big thing out of it, make a big Bundy, big Bundy cattle ranch out of it, have a big standoff and whatever. Because by engaging in that, you know, civil disobedience or engaging in the agorism, you're in some sense public. You're in some sense, you know, people can see you do it and there's information and they can take that information and tell on you and it's, it's a it's, you know, there's not perfect uh, secrecy to it. Uh, so I see crypto anarchy as a um, means to make that global and to make that almost effortless, perhaps not now, but over time the effort to kind of slip into these black markets will be easier and easier. And if you can't be identified as doing so, if that money that you transact in can't be tied to your legal identity, then there's no then, then you, you, you cut off the problem before it begins because you're denying the state the information it needs to physically prosecute you. So an interesting aspect of some of the um, drug marketplaces, for instance, like the Silk Road, uh, that were you know kind of part of the dark web where you could buy drugs or forge documents or you could buy all types of goods and services that are black and gray market stuff. Um, one of the valuable things about it was that it relied on a collection of different types of software. It relied on the Tor browser, it relied on PGP, it relied on Bitcoin, it relied on, uh, I guess, onion routing, there's different types of base protocols. But what it did was it established plausible deniability. And plausible deniability is a legal concept, which refers to the ability for someone to plausibly deny that they had any involvement with any particular event. So if somebody buys cocaine off of a, a drug marketplace and they use good PGP encryption and they have, you know, uh, and they don't give away their identity and they even encrypt their address so the other person, you know, only they can see it and all of a sudden, you know, cocaine shows up in their mailbox because that's just, you know, it used the government postal service, which is great. <laughs> um, and, but, but they'd see it in their mailbox and let's just say the police found out and they were tracking it and they came to knock on this person's door and prosecute them. The person, if he had used those tools effectively, could say, I have no idea what you're talking about. You can't, uh, this is not, you know, and it couldn't be tied to them because there's no way to break the encryption on Tor to address where the IP came from. There's no way to break the PGP encryption to find out what the address this user submitted to this buyer. All they have is encrypted data, or what they have is metadata, or they have things that won't and, and, and can't hold up in their own internal rule systems, you know, requiring evidence and things like that. So that's really interesting that you can start to be a consumer of some of these services more or less with impunity. Uh, and I don't want to run out and suggest everybody do this. It takes quite a bit of understanding of what the limitations are and, and, and how to properly assemble those things. But you can do that trusting the technology and you will not be able to be identified and addressed by the state like a spotlight is put on you. You will forever remain just an anonymous internet user that has engaged in these other things. And denying the state the information it needs to feed off of tax revenue, to feed to, to surveil people, to regulate their behavior, what they can and can't trade, what they can and can't see for in other repressive governments, things like that. The inability for the states to do that, I think, will uh, hasten its collapse uh, or, or, or hasten, hasten its demise in a way that is far faster than trying to engage in political processes. And for some of you that have attended other talks I've given on politics, I'm not uh, very warm to that idea of activism. Um, as I said before, I, th I think a lot of us are fighting in the right direction, so I don't want to uh, impugn anybody that is doing political effort or political action. Uh, you know, we have kind of a division of labor that's involved, so I understand that some people are better at things than other things. Uh, but over time, as I've thought about these issues, the focus has always changed. The focus has changed from finding some way to shrink and limit government to finding some way to, you know, freeze government at this minuscule level, this like smallest possible quantum level that government can be, and then it, and then the goal was okay, well, undermine it, and then the goal is undermine it through technology, and so on and so forth. And I think that what happens is as the knowledge changes, the attitude and the strategy should change as well. And um, I think that there are some libertarians that I know that have adopted a certain intelligence about it, they've adopted an intellectual position about the figure, but they haven't changed their strategy. 
they're still using old strategies to fight, to, 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 to gain new goals. And I think that that's true when you have people who admit to being anarchists or, or being agorists and wanting to promote this kind of underground economy. And they do, they do things like engage in electoral politics, where they run for office or they try to get votes or they try to promote somebody else to run for electoral politics. And I think that when you start identifying the values of things like agorism and crypto anarchy, you realize that the numbers game is just not important. You really only need the individual. You really just need individual achievement. It wasn't due to 10 million people thinking this or that way that Silk Road was created. It was because of Ross Ulbricht. It was because one man, or a small number of people, created this project and it had amazing effects on a future, you know, drug discussions and drug policy, on what's possible on the internet, on internet freedom, just as a, as a precedent for what the court case showed. Uh, but it was one person that was able to do that. And I think as well, when you look at something like Bitcoin, that has the potential to do so much good for us in this liberty fight, it was one person, or a group of people, so one, one Satoshi Nakamoto, that created this, that it was the genius behind this. And so I think that part of the despair of politics and education is like, well, I'm just one in a giant ocean of 100 million, and what's the point, and I'm, you know, I'm only targeting small people in this part of my town, in this part of my state, and I have to contend with geographic land masses that are you know, thousands of miles distant and things like that. And I think that when you start looking at the fight for liberty from a direction of using cryptographic tools and trying to promote the software and promote the programming and promote that development, a single person's effort can be monstrous. It can be huge. Um, Satoshi and uh, Ross Ulbricht and various other Bitcoin, you know, evangelists or whatever, but, you know, and you don't have to be a programmer to contribute, you know, I, I am not a programmer, I write, I speak, I try to engage as a dealer of information about these things, but I think that we can all kind of play a part, and I just wanted to have this discussion on the advancement of ideas and strategy. I think too many people get caught in the trap of fighting to restore the republic, or fighting to restore the constitution, or going back to the glory days, going back to some gold standard or something like that. And I think that the strategies and the emphasis should be uh, updated in light of new understandings about the state and what it means and how far each person is on that path of, I guess, what I will describe libertarian maturation, type of libertarian involvement. Um, I have met very intelligent libertarians. I have met very naive libertarians. And usually what separates them are their goals and their ways of getting to those goals. Uh, so that's the discussion that I wanted to open up, and I hope you guys think about it and carry it forward in you know, the future or whatever, but if anybody has any questions, then I'd love to answer them. You don't want to just cut people off at the knees. You want to give them something that they can use to move forward or to step up, or something that they can use in its place, some other competitive product that is helpful to them. And this discussion about using politics in addition to other strategies is what we discuss frequently, if not every day, here in New Hampshire and in discussions with other free state friends of mine. You know, we talk about what is the optimal strategy and what kind of good are you doing in politics, or vice versa, what kind of bad are you doing in politics? And I'm sympathetic to there being a division of labor, but I think that politics is at best a lagging indicator. Politics never actually leads any social change. 
It is just a reflection of social change. So if there's going to be so, if there's going to be a change in politics or a change in law, it's got to come from a certain social uh, energy that directs it through representatives, and then the representatives catch up and they, you know, change it to allow raw milk or to, you know, to allow whatever, to allow same-sex marriage, whatever it is, marijuana decriminalization. You, you couldn't have that without the social energy, right? You couldn't have that without 60% of people thinking that marijuana should be decriminalized or whatever it is. Uh, so. I like to focus my energies on targeting the social, targeting the society, changing the culture, you know, making things like Bitcoin and anarchy popular in art and in media and in writing and whatever, and trying to penetrate the social consciousness. Um, because I think politics is just kind of the caboose of that whole movement. And then there's my opinions on politics just being a toxic environment to begin with. Um, and I think that's true of any kind of political system where it just encourages a lot of compromise and it encourages a lot of short, short gains, immediately short gains that don't get you to where you want to go. Like the way that I think of politics is a great metaphor given to me by William Kostrick. And he says it's kind of like people who climb a tree because they want to get to the moon. And you say, well, you can climb at the very top of the tree. You are closer to the moon than you were when you were on the ground. It's true. But you're never going to get to the moon by climbing a tree. And in fact, you may in fact be further away from getting to the moon because now you've got to climb down the tree and then do whatever it is you're going to do. <laughs> so and, uh, that kind of stuck with me. I don't know if it's perfectly accurate, but that's kind of the way I feel about politics. You know, if there were a Barack Obama of the liberty movement, if there were somebody that were like absolutely energetic and charismatic, that was that could you know had the mightiest touch for people's minds or something like that, we could just turn and you know energize and encapsulate people. Then I say, go for it. Enter into the political arena, enter into the Colosseum, and sharpen your skills at demagoguery or diplomacy, or sharpen your skills at you know uh, 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 making deals or compromising. However, the game needs to be played. You no, know, I just don't like the game. I don't like the rules. I don't like how the players play. But if there was somebody that were amazing at that, then it would be irresponsible for me to say, oh, you know, you should be a programmer instead. But, Can I make a quick response? Sure. The only thing I would say is that. People in politics can directly benefit people by keeping them out of jail. For example, yes. as, as an example, if they're able to, if we're able to get a constitutional carry passed in New Hampshire, then people won't be criminalized just for covering their gun or shirt. Just like if they pass marijuana decrim, people won't yeah. be arrested for having under an ounce of marijuana or yes. whatever it is. You're, you're right that it lags behind those rules, but at the same time, whenever those laws do get passed, it's directly beneficial there. There is a short term gain to be had, I agree. The, uh, the counter argument to that is what kind of precedent are you establishing for future social change? You're implying that the voting booth or that the electoral process is a good or legitimate way, and I'd rather, I'd rather discount that method. I, I think, in my, in my assessment or in my calculus, I think that the opportunity cost is too great. I think that people can be better spent doing social outreach, doing, you know, uh, you know, homeschooling and peaceful parenting, you know, all doing, you know, the litany of other two different types of strategies, but I do understand your perspective and I, we engage in this all the time. Um, here in New Hampshire, and that's why there are so many people that run for office and do it, and there's a dozen free staters in the legislature, and so that's an interesting, we have a real life example of what will happen to anarchists when they spend time in a, in a, in a, in a legal system. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I don't know if I have heard this, but ordinary people, not libertarians, uh, think that they, need, they see a benefit in the government because they see, they, you know, it has rules about safety of products and it has rules about what you can do and what you can't. And we, a lot of us probably want those things, you know, and that you have to honor contracts and stuff. I mean, um, do you see any things happening now in the alternative or egregious economy that is building some of those safety safeguards in uh, so your parents? Somebody buys something, they're not going to it. Sure. There's a con uh, conflict, they can have a conflict resolved with money or property or something. Do you sure. see any of these things being built? They're, they're being built, but they're in the early stages of being built. And they're in the early stages, not because they're not where needed until now, but they're early stages because to, to do that in an alternative way requires new technology that has only become available kind of recently. So something like consumer regulation or like fraud protection and something like Bitcoin um, can be solved with escrow in, in the technology. So there's, there's a way that you can use keys of a Bitcoin you know, uh, wallet to have 
what's what, like a trustless escrow system where there's three keys and you need two to spend and you you have, you have one and your person you're buying from has one and there's an escrow that has one and if the conditions aren't met then this things aren't signed and it doesn't spend and so there's a certain protection using escrow in that way um, that doesn't require like a central like a, like some other notary or some other central authority. There's things like um, the Peacekeeper app, which is an app that you can download on your phone, which if your other friends download it and you send out a beacon, their smartphones will get the beacon so they can come to your aid quickly, kind of a quick, kind of um, spontaneous voluntary order, kind of a protection to it. Um, there's marketplaces that are emerging that have advanced things like ratings and reviews on them that serve as incentives to prevent against certain measures. So, you know, but th th these things are still kind of shoots out of the soil. So it's really difficult to, to look, it's just speculation when you say, well, you know, it'll be structured this way, and the insurance agencies will handle this, and the, the protection agencies will handle this. It's all, that's all just kind of speculation. Uh, but we're starting to see the beginnings of that in um, certain parts of the Bitcoin space and in other libertarian spaces. You know, the idea of like a reputation market this is a valuable emergence as well. I want to guess a little bit, like Airbnb, which I participated in. Sure. Like, yes, sure. Reviewing and, and that yep. helps. That's part of a reputation market. Right. Part of your, part of your, you know, your value as being a member of the community that you hold a certain reputation that you can be trusted and so forth. So that is emerging. But those are the those are the things that the state literally requires for its existence. So those things are what it will fight the hardest for. So I think that those things may be the last coming. I think that alternatives. Like alternative schooling, alternative healthcare, alternative, you know, different it, different infrastructures maybe maybe may happen sooner than the, literally the bread and butter of the state, which is its enforcement of its monopoly on on force. Um, that may take a while. Could you repeat what people say to you? So, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Sure, please, thanks. Sure. Uh, so the question before was a discussion of what current examples of alternative institutions are existing to address the need for law and security and things like that. You know, some examples of. You know, website rating reviews and certain kind of bis uh, 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 Bitcoin advances allow for protections in certain ways, but it is it is still some time coming. Yes, sir. So I'm wondering um, at, at what point in the process of the entrepreneur who's trying to disrupt this government, what point do you think that it makes sense for them to go and I don't know get permission if they're but just like. Make yeah. someone in the government aware that you're doing this so that you don't end up in jail. Right. But at the same time, you don't cut yourselves off. Exactly. So that's always a case by case kind of calculus. I don't want anyone to be a martyr for libertarianism. I don't think everyone should be necessarily willing to go to jail to not pay a poll tax, like, you know, like Thoreau did or things like that. So, you know, in a certain sense, like I love Uber, for instance. I think it's a great design. I think it utterly cuts the taxi companies at the knees. And I think that's an example of an alternative institution like ride sharing. And Airbnb does that for hotels and hospitality and things like that too. Um, where in a certain sense, it makes sense for the owners of that company or the people of that company to pay court fees and to, to go to trial and to fight and to take part in this kind of circus or in this game. Um, and it makes sense because if they didn't, then their existence would be very short-lived. And you have to assess there's still more disruption to be had. So we, we, but it's good for us to live a little bit longer and fight for another day than it is for us to take our ground here. But the exact point at which individuals or entrepreneurs or companies should stake the ground here at this agorist moment is always going to be an individual basis. You know, uh, that scene in Atlas Shrugged when you know he goes into the courtroom and he's just totally you know insolent and not obeying their edicts and having his own kind of moment with it, being theatrical with it. That's going to come at, at each person's discretion and each person's basis. Dude, dot com.